you could feel the excitement in the camp. For two years, the Israelites had been wandering throughout the desert, and now they were getting ready to step foot into the promised land. Moses was a wise leader, so he decided he need in, needed intel. So he sent 12 spies into the promised land. God approved that plan. For 40 days, they'd walk 500 miles. And when they came back, 10 of the 12 spies would give a bad report. They would say, yeah, this is a great land. It's a promised land like God promised. However, there are fortified cities. They're too big for us to handle. The people are tough, too tough for us to fight. Joshua and Caleb, the other two spies said, no, no, God has promised us this land. Let, let's roll, let's get in, let's ride, let's take this land. Let's take what God has given us. Let's walk by faith, not by sight. Well, the 10 spies convinced not only Moses, but all of the Israelites that they needed to wait before they crossed the obstacle and went into the promised land. That upset not only the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, that upset God. So God punished them. For the next 38 years, they would wander through the desert. Fast forward 38 years, Moses is getting ready to die. He passes the mantle of leadership to Joshua. Joshua then is ready to lead the people into the promised land. After 30 days of mourning, the dust is thick in the air and they're ready to cross the obstacle to go into the promised land. But there's a problem. There's an obstacle. Now, God had told Joshua over and over, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous because I'm gonna be with you wherever you go. But the obstacle was the Jordan River. In scripture, river, rivers normally show life. They represent some form of life, positive things, but not here. The Jordan was an obstacle. So God tells Joshua, get ready. I'm gonna do something radical in your life. It's gonna be new. It's gonna be different. And you've gotta face this obstacle walking by faith, not by sight. Have you ever considered that when we face obstacles in our lives, we tend to walk by sight rather than walking by faith? We will pray, but usually those prayers put God in a box. You know, we give him ultimatums. We expect him to operate on our moral compass. We expect him to act the way we want him to act. Sometimes we, we will simply look at an obstacle and freak out. We'll worry and will fret instead of saying, God, I just trust you. I trust you to get me through this obstacle no matter what it is. Well, such is what we're gonna talk about today. In fact, if you get anything at all out of today's teaching, get this. God is leading us into a new day by means of a new way. He's leading us into a new day, a new season by means of a new way. Today, we're gonna to look at obstacles in our lives because all of us are facing obstacles right now. And God's gonna give us a way to handle those, those obstacles. Well, God's got a lot to say about that as we step into a new and completely different season of life. I mean, last week, the week before last, school kicked off in a new and different way. Football season has kicked off, praise Jesus, in a new and different way. Basketball season, Major League Baseball, it's all winding down in a new and different way. Last week in Skagit, we opened our doors in definitely a new and different way. And here in Bellingham next week, we're gonna be opening our doors, but it's gonna be in a new and different way. More on that later on in today's teaching. Life this fall is definitely different. How do we deal with it? Well, we go to God's word. And that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to be hanging out in Joshua chapter three. Joshua is the sixth book of the Old Testament. So turn in your Bibles. Let me set the scene for what's going on. Always go back 2000 years ago to that time when Jesus died, was buried and resurrected. The most important event in history. And for us as Christ followers, that resurrection is our cornerstone that we hang on to. Go 1500 years before that. And we're picking up the Israeli nation as Moses has died and as Joshua is getting ready to lead them into the promised land. A lot of the background of this I don't have to go into because we spent an entire summer talking about Moses. So God has told Joshua, get ready to go. I'm gonna do something crazy as you face an obstacle. What's God gonna do? And how's he gonna tell us to face those obstacles? Let's take a look. Joshua 3 verse one. 
Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. So God tells Joshua, leave this place called Shittim. It's in the Valley of Moab. Some of your translations say the Acacia Groves instead of Shittim. It's the same place. He says, I'm gonna do something crazy. I'm gonna do something big. And there's tension in the air. That tension is a tension between unbelief versus belief. The unbelief of we can't get across there, the obstacle's too big. That's the MO of the Israelites. But the, t- but, but the belief is much greater that we can do this. They've got a godly leader like they had with Moses. And this time after walking 40 years in the desert, they're ready to set foot in the promised land. God's saying, let's go, let's do this. Go where I'm calling you. It's a new day. It's a new way. Verses two through four. After three days, the officers went through the camp giving orders to the people. They said this, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you're to do what? You're to move out from your positions. You're to follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. Underline that first part of verse four. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. No more cloud by day, pillar of fire by night with God's GPS. He's doing something different and it's with the ark. Let's talk about the ark. We need to do kind of a review of what the ark is. If you go back to week seven of our Moses series, Pastor Bob covered in detail the ark of the covenant. It's a rectangular, uh, a rectangular treasure of the Israelites. It was made of wood on the outside, gold on the top. And the Israelites, for the Israelites, it was their most treasured piece or relic. For the Israelites, it symbolized the exact presence of God. Inside of the the Ark of the Covenant were three things. The tablet that, that was the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, they represent the character of God. It also had that jar of manna, the manna that represented provision that God would always provide. And up to this time, God would provide manna and quail every day. But at this time, it stopped because they're getting ready to set foot in the promised land. Then last but not least, there was Aaron's staff. Aaron's staff represented leadership and God's leadership specifically, specifically during difficult times. The Levites are the ministers of the law and they're required to carry this several hundred pound box called the Ark of the Covenant. And it's important. In fact, if you look at this this totality of this, this passage of scripture, 16 times the Ark is mentioned. So God says to Joshua, get ready, get ready. Here we go. We're, I'm going to do something crazy. And so Joshua then tells the officers what to do. And the officers say to the people, then you will know which way to go when you follow the ark, since you've never been this way before. And isn't that 2020? I mean, if we look back a year ago, we would not have guessed that, that this year would be uh, ending up like it is ending up. As we wrap into the last quarter of 2020, But God says, where I'm taking you, you haven't been, strap in. Let's continue on in verse four. The second half of verse four says this, but keep a distance of about a thousand yards, a thousand yards, that's a little bit more than a half mile between you and the ark, do not get near it. So God makes it clear. You got an obstacle in front of you. I'm gonna be out in front of you. I'm gonna be way out in front of you, but don't get ahead of me. I need you to stay focused, which begs a question. What's your focus right now? What's your focus right now as you're working from home, trying to work online with your kids going to school online and you're trying to keep them in line? Where's your focus? For many of our senior saints, you are isolated. Some of you are living in assisted living facilities. Some of you are living in apartments and homes by yourself and it's difficult. Where's your focus? I recently heard of about a young man, he's an American citizen, goes out on one date with his Canadian uh, gal that he meets and, and they go on one date and then they shut the borders down the next day. And they're struggling. Each day they go up to the border, they high five, they wave to each other, but they haven't even been able to hold hands and they're looking forward to that time when the border restriction is lifted. And to not only them, but to anyone in awkward dating situations now because of COVID-19, where's your focus? Some of you have been in either an economic or an employment holding pattern where you can't get promoted in your job or you've recently uh, had your job downsized as in you've been laid off. It's a difficult time. Where's your focus? The beautiful thing 
about this passage we're looking at, at today is that God's just saying, not only am I here, but I'm out in front of you. And not only am I out in front of you, I am way out in front of you. It's a new day, it's a new way. Will you follow me? Will you simply trust me? Let's go on, verse five. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. Underline that word, consecrate. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do something amazing, some amazing things among you. Consecrate. It's a religious term and what it means is to set yourself apart. What would happen in a time of consecration with the Hebrew nation is you do two things. You do an internal gut check. That means you would make sure you were totally focused on God. You get rid of that, that uncleanliness in your heart. But then on the outside, you'd have to get rid of that uncleanliness too. The people would bathe. The, the men would trim their beards. They'd change clothes. It, it was very serious to God when he said, consecrate yourself. But con consecrate, married couples couldn't even have sex during that time. So God was serious about this. And it symbolized a new beginning. It symbolized what? A new day and a new way. Let's keep on going, verses six and seven. Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. Remember, God's a thousand yards out in front of them with that Ark. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so they may know that I'm with you as I was with Moses. So as a leader, you got to have two things. You have to have authority and you have to have credibility. If you just have authority, you can lord it over people, but you're not going to be able to get them to point A to point B. You got to have those street creds. God had done that with Moses. Now he's doing that with Joshua. Last week, uh, we saw Pastor Bob do that for Caitlin. Caitlin, an amazing leader. She's our student ministry director. If you missed her sermon last week, you missed out. You need to go back and take a look at it. And what, God, what, uh, what Bob did Oops, almost messed, mixed up that one, Bob and God. Okay, um, <laughs> what Bob did is he gave Caitlin the authority to speak from the platform, but she needed credibility. Everybody in student ministry, they trust her. All of us on staff, they trust her, but many of you don't even know her. So he had to give that credibility and talk about her and her background, and she knocked it out of the park. So leaders, we always got to make sure the people we're setting up for success, the people who work for us, we got to give them authority and credibility. Let's keep on going. Verse eight. He said, tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. And I look at this and I go, wait, what? Go and stand in the river? I mean, think about this. As I said, in scripture, rivers represent life, prosperity, but here it represents an obstacle. And how's that? What we're going to find out in this story is that it's flood season. That river is, is flowing 10 feet higher than normal. It's flowing fast. It's flowing furiously. And so the Jordan River, I've been told during dry season, there are places where you can cross the Jordan River and not even get your knees wet. But you got a million plus people you got to take across. It's flood stage. And there's no way you can swim across. There's no way you can make enough boats to get across and get across safely. So you have to have divine intervention. That's important for us because that flood's really, really big. It's an obstacle. Whenever we face an obstacle, we have, to say, we have to remember this, that the size of your flood pales in comparison with the size of your God. The size of your flood, whatever obstacle is in front of you, the size of that pales in comparison to the size of our God. We serve a big, big God. Psalm 50 says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That means he's sovereign over everything. He's bigger than your obstacle and he'll either get you around it or take you right through it and never leave you nor forsake you. So God tells these Levite priests, it just stinks to be them. They got to carry the several hundred pound box down to the muddy riverbank and they have to step into the river. They have to step into the obstacle. That's an important point for us because when we face obstacles in our lives, we gotta do three things. Whenever you face an obstacle, three things you gotta do. You gotta own it, you gotta lean into it, you have to trust and obey. Own it, lean into it, trust and obey. What do I mean by that? First of all, you gotta own it. You have to own the reality of the situation. My name is Kip, K-I-P. A lot of times I think keep it positive because I'm a very optimistic person. But when I come up to an obstacle, I have to own the reality of the situation, the difficulty, because you can't positively think through certain things. You have to understand what you're facing. 
Many of you have gone through a divorce and you know when you've gone through that divorce, it's so difficult and you grieve that marriage. But people are counting on you and you have to, to not only grieve the loss of that marriage, but now you've got to move forward. You've got to own the situation. It's difficult, but your kids and other people around you are counting on you. Maybe you've lost something instead of a marriage. It's been a job. Maybe it's a, a death in the family. It, maybe it's your house. Maybe it's your finances. Whatever it is, it's good to grieve that loss. But never let a season of grief turn into a lifetime of misery. You got to own it. You got to say, okay, here's the reality of the situation. And then the second thing is you got to lean into it. There's work you've got to do as God does work within this situation. Back when I was in the military, we had a saying, you have to lean into the pain and terrain. And I remember one of the units that I was in, uh, we we're doing mountain operations. We're climbing on all fours up these really steep slopes. I got, you know, several, it seemed like several hundred pounds of, of weight in my rucksack. It was really more like probably a hundred pounds or so, but I had my weapons, all that stuff. And, and I remember I'm, I'm leaning into the mountain. I'm, I'm trying to climb up this very steep slope. And my operations sergeant said, come on, sir, you got to lean into the pain and terrain. Don't miss this. You see, I had a burden on my shoulders. That burden was the weight of my rucksack. And if I would lean back away from the obstacle, I'd fall backwards and I could not only hurt myself or even kill myself, I could hurt the people or kill the people around me. I gotta lean into it, lean into the pain and terrain. And that's what you gotta do when you face an obstacle. There's work you have to do. Then last, but definitely not least, you gotta trust and obey. Trust and obey God. Know that he is not only in the obstacle with you, he's timeless. So he's on the other side of the obstacle. He's walking with you through that obstacle. It's a time in which you have to choose faith over fear. I've said it so many times from this platform, when you hit a time of anxiety, a time of difficulty, it's so easy to focus on what if. What if the worst thing happens? And God says, no, 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 <clears throat> focus on me. Focus on me and say, even if, even if the worst thing happens, I'm going to get you through this. Understand that God owns any and every situation. Skip down to verse 11 for time's sake. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant represents God. So God is going into the obstacle ahead of you. If you're going through hell right now, understand God's been through it. He's been back. He's walking with you. So the Israelites have to own their obstacle. They have to lean into it and they have to trust and obey that God's gonna do something big. And why is that? Because it's a new day and a new way. Okay, skip down to verse 13. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstreams will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And this makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. Uh, several hundred pounds, these Levite ministers are going to be carrying the ark of the covenant of God. And they're going to step down into the Jordan River, which is, is, is at flood stage. It's flowing fast. It makes no sense. It's counter intuitive. Well, one of the units I got to serve in, it was so much fun to be in this unit. I got to go to a lot of really cool schools, anti-terrorism driving school, things like that. At your expense, thank you taxpayers. I really appreciate that. But one of the schools I wanted to go to so bad was scout swim school. It's not like boy scout swimming. This is like, this is long distance swimming with all of your equipment, underwater infiltration. It's a really cool school. And by nature of my position, my job and my background, I had like a 1% chance to get into this school. And all my buddies are like, why are you training so hard? You got a 1% chance. And I said, yeah, but it's still a chance. Well, I started training. I was training every day for months on end, two to three hours a day. I was living in the Olympic swimming pool or, or in American Lake uh, down at Joint Base Lewis McCord doing these long distance swims. And I remember one day I had, I was in my uniform, not like my dress uniform, because that'd be kind of weird being in the water and that. It was my camouflage uniform. I'm at the, the bottom of the deep end of the pool. You know, you have no scuba equipment on, so I'm trying to control my breathing. I'm holding on to these 20 pound dumbbells as I'm walking on the bottom of the swimming pool, trying to control my breathing. My lungs are screaming and I look up and I see these people swimming by and I know they're looking down at me going, what is this weirdo doing? It makes no sense. It's counterintuitive. Hashtag prune boy. Hashtag didn't get in the school. Hashtag counterintuitive. 
And I think that's part of the point of this whole story. So often in our lives, God wants us to live our lives uh, counterintuitively to what the world wants us to live our lives. The way we manage our careers, the way we handle our finances, our dating life, our marriages, our relationships, our sexuality. It's different than what the world expects and says we should or shouldn't do. It's counterintuitive. So God says to Joshua, okay, Josh, 38 years ago, you did it differently. Now I want you to do it my way. Are you ready to go? It's a new day. It's a new way. Look what happens, verses 14 through 16. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Remember, they're a thousand yards ahead. They can still see them, but they're way out in front. That's God out in front. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. We talked about that. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, bam, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. So people crossed over opposite Jericho. They crossed through the Jordan, but don't miss this. They crossed through the Jordan and then they'd go into prolonged combat, a long time of combat operations. We're gonna come back to that, put a pin in it. And their feet touched the water's edge. I love this. Isn't it cool how sometimes you need to get your feet wet to experience a miracle of God? How God uses people around us and sometimes each and every one of us in our own lives so we can experience that that miracle. But you gotta step into your own personal Jordan. You gotta get your feet wet. I wanna do a shout out right now to the Second Wake Up House. Second Wake Up House, we love you guys. Lance and Colleen, all you heroes there. You guys are amazing. You're heroes in my book. For those of you who don't know about the Second Wake Up House, uh, these are just great people in addiction recovery who are leaning into it. People who have owned it, leaned into it, and they trust and obey. They want to experience the miracle of sobriety. But let me talk to any of you dealing with addiction right now. If you want to experience the miracle of sobriety, there's work you gotta do. You gotta own it. You gotta say, I've got a problem. And then you gotta lean into it. Sometimes that means going off to treatment. It always means you go to your meetings, you do your step work, you've got your sponsor and work with your sponsor. And then on top of that, you gotta trust and obey. Trust that God's got you, that he's gonna get you through it day by day, sometimes hour by hour, and when you feel like relapsing, minute by minute. But in order to to experience that miracle, you gotta step into your own personal Jordan. You gotta get your feet wet. How about this one? You're wanting to walk in calling. God has a purpose for your life, and you want him to, to lead you into that purpose, but you feel like you're in a dead end job. Have you owned it yet? Have you owned it and said, if I want to experience the miracle of walking in purpose, there's work I've got to do. I've got to have that that good work ethic. I got to be a man or a woman of character, honor, integrity, and faith. Is there work you need to do with schooling, with things to get you to, to step into that calling? Because if you want to experience that miracle of walking and calling, you got to step into your own personal Jordan. You got to get your feet wet. Many of you are adult parents or grandparents, and and you've got adult kids or young adults who have walked away from their faith. And you're praying and praying, you're wanting them to come back to the faith that you raised them in. Have you ever considered that if you want to experience that miracle of watching them come back into the faith or enter a a relationship with Jesus, there's work you gotta do? In the morning, before your feet hit the pavement, are your knees hitting the floor, praying for that lost one in your life? Let me, from experience, I will tell you that a a wayward child can't, cannot outrun the prayers of a godly mom or dad or parents, grandma, grandpa, or grandparents, especially when they're united in prayer. But you gotta step into the Jordan, your own personal Jordan. You've got to get your feet wet. Verse 17. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on what? On dry ground. Guys, this is another Red Sea moment. It's another Red Sea moment. Remember when, when, when God used Moses to part the Red Sea and the million plus Israelites came through with Pharaoh and his army trudging in behind him. It was dry ground. It's happening again only 40 years later. 
The Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation, the entire nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is all about God's sovereignty. God was in control of the situation as they faced their obstacle. He told the priests what to do, but remember, they had to step into the Jordan to experience the miracle. They had to be obedient. He told the people, keep your eyes on me. Keep focused on me. When the, when the, the priests step into the Jordan, you guys are going to walk by on dry ground. The people had to be obedient to experience that miracle. Even the water had to be obedience. The point is this. The key ingredients were the people and the priests being obedient. Obedience is the key ingredient here. 38 years earlier, the Israelites had lacked faith didn't turn out well for them. This time they didn't walk by sight, they walked by faith. And what did God do? He got them through the obstacle. So many times we wanna go around that obstacle, but no, this time God gets them through the obstacle. It's a new day, it's a new way. And I love this story. I love this story because not only does it give us practical ways to deal with obstacles in our lives, it shows us that God is always with us as we deal with these obstacles. And as I close this portion of the sermon, don't click off yet, I'm not done. We're doing the challenge a little bit early today. As I close this portion of the sermon, I want you to think about obstacles in your life. Obstacles you need to own, you need to lean into, where you need to trust and obey God. And ask yourself this question, what's my Jordan? What's my Jordan? What's my own personal Jordan that I need to step into, that I gotta own? What's the work that I have to do right now? And how am I totally surrendering it to God to walk by faith and not by sight, no matter how big the obstacle is? Because remember, the size of your obstacle pales in comparison with the size of your God. But understand this too. God got the Israelites through that obstacle. And then right after that, they'd be going into combat for a prolonged time. And that's important for us too, because when God gets us through obstacles, it's not over on this side of eternity because blessings come with battles. Blessings come with battles. And in our, in our job, when we're in those battles, as we're facing down those obstacles, as we're watching through those obstacles, our job is to reflect Jesus who holds all things together. It's the beauty of this story. Remember in Moses, we said every week, here's how Jesus jumps off the pages. Okay, let's talk about how Jesus jumps off the pages here because it's amazing. Think about this. Joshua, his name in Hebrew is Yeshua. Jesus, his name in Hebrew is Yeshua. It means the Lord saves. Joshua would lead the people into the promised land. Jesus would lead us into that eternal life with God the Father through him. Joshua and the people had an obstacle. It was the Jordan River, and it was too big for them to, to get across on their own. They couldn't do it on their own. They couldn't swim across. They couldn't make boats and get across. They needed divine intervention. And for us, that obstacle in our life is sin. And there's no way we can do enough good works to get across that river of sin. We needed Jesus to step down from heaven and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He put his feet in the water. And then what God did, the sinless son of God, Jesus, he slammed him up against a cross and he drowned him in the river of sin. He died, he's buried, he's resurrected. And now he sits at the right hand of the father and there's this dry ground. We get to go across. There's a cross right in the middle of the river Jordan. And we get to walk right through it and by it for eternal life, for a life that has hope, a life that, in which Jesus gives us wisdom, courage, strength, patience, compassion to be the men and women he's called us to be. That fires me up about this story. And, and if you're not clicking amen in the chat room, you better be doing it now. There better be tons of hearts going off in there because if this auditorium were full right now, it would be on fire. I love this story. So what I wanna do what I want to do now is I want to shift gears because it's all about Jesus. Everything we do here is about Jesus. And I want to pass the, the baton for Skagit over to Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian, uh, share some, some vision. Talk with the people of Skagit about what's coming up. And here in Bellingham, for those of you online, I want you to stay and I want to talk through what our reopening looks like. I want to give you the why behind the what.
I want to walk through what we are doing and why. Because we're facing an obstacle. That obstacle is reopening our doors under the mandates that the government has given us. And we have decided that we are going to abide by those mandates 100%. We're an elder-led church, and the pastors and elders have unanimously decided that this is the best way to love our community well and love people well. And we've heard from you. That has upset so many of you that we're doing it that way. Uh, you've, You've reminded us of our constitutional rights, and you can make an argument that there's a constitutional right for us to open our doors disregarding all mandates. You can make that argument. I love the Constitution. For 28 years, I served in the military. And in the military, I swore to support and defend the Constitution, not a president, not a system, but the Constitution of the United States against all enemy, foreign, and domestic. I am passionate, as you can see, about the Constitution. But I refuse to look at Scripture through the lens of the Constitution. I refuse to. We here at Cornwall Church, when we look at Scripture, we look at it through the lens of Jesus. Jesus, who didn't demand his rights, but who consistently gave away his rights for the betterment of others. I've met with many of you over the past few weeks, many of you with compromised immune systems. I've got people in my family and extended family family with compromised immune systems. And each and every one of you has, have said thank you. Thank you, Cornwall Church, for going about it this way because you're loving me well. And thank you for giving us that encouragement. We appreciate that. In order for us to love well, We're going to abide by the very strict mandate, six pages of mandates on spiritual gatherings. We've had a task force meeting for several months. We've put in up to more than 100 hours, I think, of work and looking at how we can reopen safely. We've worked with, with, with churches all over the country in different phases of reopening. So we didn't approach this blindly, but it all came back to this. How do we love people well? Our vision here at Cornwall Church is to glorify God by altering the spiritual landscape one life at a time through Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The unchurched who are watching us right now would have an obstacle in front of them to learn about Jesus, to hear about Jesus, if we opened our doors with no regard for safety of others. So that's how we're doing it. We're taking on the attitude of Jesus. Look at this, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Your attitude, Paul writes, your attitude, your attitude, say attitude with me, attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but look what he did. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, look what he did. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. He didn't demand his rights. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So our obstacle that we are owning is COVID-19 and doing it in a safe way and supporting in this season the government mandates that are placed on us. What does that look like? Take a look at this four-minute video, and then I'll come up and I'll talk about what it means to lean into that, trust and obey, and then talk about what's coming up in the next several months this fall. Hey, Cornwall Church. You know, it'd be an understatement to say that we've missed seeing your faces. It's for that reason that our reopening task force has spent the last several months creating a plan to be able to reopen our Bellingham campus based on Washington State guidelines for spiritual gatherings. So this fall, we are reopening and you can help us stay open by following these guidelines. Here are 10 things you can expect when you return to the building in person. You can help us stay open and stay safe in the following areas. In accordance with state and CDC guidelines, attendees must wear face coverings while attending service in person at Cornwall Church. Please ensure that your face mask fully covers your nose and your mouth at all times. If for some reason you cannot wear a face covering, then attending in person is not a good fit for you. Continue to connect and gather with church online at one of our three service times. When you arrive, we'll have our parking volunteers direct you to an open space. We ask that you put your face coverings on as you exit your vehicle and follow social distancing protocol with others both in and outdoors while on campus at Cornwall Church. 
We will only have one door open for our weekend services. Our lower level main entrance doors will be open 20 minutes before the start of service. Please follow the directions on the signs. At this time, we can accommodate up to 200 people per service. All doors will remain locked until 20 minutes before service start, and social distancing guides have been placed on the sidewalk to assist with entering. Once the doors open, we have worked hard to create a touch-free experience for you. If you have a question regarding our health and safety guidelines, or may be experiencing any symptoms while on site, find your way to the health checkpoint in the Commons. We ask that if you are not feeling well, please stay home and gather with us online. For now, our Explorers League Children's Ministry classrooms are closed. Kids are welcome in the auditorium and encouraged to sit with you. We will have on-demand content available each week for your children preschool through fifth grade. In addition, the nursing mother's room will be closed. Our auditorium seating has been redesigned to create more space during our worship time together. Once you are seated with your household, a Cornwall volunteer will close the seats around you, creating the required social distancing while gathering indoors. Due to the strict guidelines for face masks or face coverings, all those attending and serving will be required to wear face masks. Cornwall Church will be hosting services on the big screens, similar to watching online, but surrounded by your church family. Pastors and staff will be on site to make live announcements at the start of service and again to close the service. We know that it's not ideal to sing in and wear a covering over your face for long periods of time, but we are committed to staying open and staying safe, and this is where we need your help. And while we all love our coffee, we ask that you refrain from bringing any beverages into the building so that you can keep your face coverings on during the service. For the safety of both you and our volunteers, we will not be passing anything out on the weekends. You can continue to take notes on the Cornwall app by clicking This Weekend and Sermon Notes. Giving can continue to be done online through text, the Cornwall app, the Cornwall website, and for those who would like to give cash or check in person, we have tithe and offering boxes positioned throughout the building. Restrooms are open with new one-way entrance and exit instructions for social distancing. We've taken the time to ensure the safety precautions necessary for gathering in person. Our amazing facilities team have placed hand sanitizing stations throughout the building for your use, and a team of Cornwall volunteers will be cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting before and after each service time. Our reopening task force continues to get updates and revisions for Washington State guidelines on spiritual gatherings. We thank you in advance for your grace and understanding as you help us stay open. If you choose to continue watching church online, you can catch service every weekend at cornwallchurch.com. And if joining us in person is a good fit for you, we look forward to seeing you real soon. Okay, so you guys can see it's very difficult what we're doing. Let's talk about masks, first of all. If you cannot be in a mask for an hour and 15 minutes straight, then the online option is the best option for you. If you cannot control your kids in the auditorium because we don't have Explorers League for an hour and 15 minutes and the kids six years old and older can't keep their masks on, then the online option is the option for you. There will be nothing live on stage. All of our sermons are pre-recorded. All the music is pre-recorded. And we're doing that because there's a very small number of you that have been totally isolated, that have no community whatsoever. And so this gathering is for you if you can meet those requirements. But for the rest of you, this is what we want. We want you to lean into it. Lean into it. What do I mean by that? God has given us an opportunity to reach people who normally wouldn't come to a church. And that opportunity is church at home. You know, I've shared it so many times. I love Jenny and Roy Redmond. I've seen them doing this. We've had others where they invite people over to their homes every week and they watch the sermon. They have conversations. The unchurched, the people in your neighborhoods are more willing to come to your house than they are to a church. In Acts 20, verse 20, Think about that. Acts 20, verse 20. It's the year 2020. No coincidence that God back then said, I'm doing something new and different. It's a new day in a new way. You're not going to meet in the synagogue anymore. We're told, Acts 20, verse 20, that the 
Apostle Paul went from house to house preaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus. What if, what if folks, right now God is saying, I'm tearing down the scaffolding of the church. This season is not time to be coming back into a building. This season is the time to be out into your community, out having people into your house, serving into your, in your community, walking with your neighbors, showing them me. It's all about Jesus. What if that's what God's telling us at this time? Jesus relinquished his rights. And we want to do the same thing, that constitutional right to meet. We want to love well. So we're going to trust and obey. We're going to trust what God has led the leadership of our church to do in this next season. We're gonna trust that it's the good, right thing and we're gonna lean into it hard. We're gonna own the difficulty of the situation and I guarantee you, we're gonna see miracles happen because what God said to Joshua 3,500 years ago is that I'm getting ready to do something radical. It's a new day, it's a new way. He's saying that to us right now. Will you trust? Will you obey? Will you grab onto this obstacle and own it? Will you lean into it and trust and obey? Well, we're excited about what's coming up. We've got, it's so cool. Next weekend, Pastor Bob is gonna be back on this platform. And we're so excited because we are going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of my favorite chunks of scripture, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's gonna take us all the way into Christmas. We're gonna spend multiple weeks pulling apart the Sermon on the Mount, which is all about counterculture, which is all about the world flipped upside down. It's all about us reflecting Jesus instead of reflecting the world. You don't want to miss it.
Oh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you. We thank you for obstacles that become opportunities. We thank you that you own all of those obstacles. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. You own all things. Jesus, you keep all things together. And we thank you for that. As we step into this next season, we pray for courage. We pray for wisdom. We pray for patience and compassion. We pray that we love people well. And when we want to demand our rights and we close our fists, we actually surrender and walk with grace and truth and love. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May he shower you with grace and give you great peace this week. Thanks a lot, folks. See you next week.